Welcome to the wide world of esports, the show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Our show today is Get in the Game with Hado, the world's first augmented reality physical esports. With me today is Shane Vanderkoy, the CEO and founder of Hado. Welcome, Shane. Great to be here. Thanks so much for having me, Catherine. So, what is Hado? That's a great question. And the first time I, I've got to share this, the first time that I, I, I showed Hado um, about a year and a half ago to my business partner, the first thing out of his mouth was, this looks like dodgeball meets Marvel. And so that, that description kind of sticks a little bit. But um, if, you, if you see Hado, you see a video or you watch a Hado gameplay, it takes uh, folks like me back to sort of dodgeball days. But it is an augmented reality game. And um, it, was, it was created in Japan. And so I can't say I'm the CEO of Hado. I didn't get to say that. I can't say that I created Hado, but we, I'm the founder here of Hado USA, and we're bringing it here to the United States. And I think a brief, a, a short description would be: it's, it is the world's first augmented reality physical esports. I think it um, it kind of converges or comes up the middle between physical sports and gaming. And um, essentially, it's it's a game that has uh, three players versus three players on a physical court. It's not done purely on a screen. We need uh, it's location based. Uh, players wear headsets. I've got one. I don't know if you'll be able to see it here, but it looks like this. It's it's just a simple augmented reality um, uh, headset. Inside is an Apple iPhone and players also wear uh, an iPhone on their wrist. And um, because it's augmented, they're, they're playing in the space, they see the real space, they see their opponents, but they also see these augmented elements that are part of the game. So just kind of like real dodgeball, players are able to fling, in this case, energy balls at their opponents. The opponents, of course, are trying not to get hit, just like in real dodgeball. Um, they have augmented reality, like digital images of life petals, where they're in their chest area. And players can actually see these energy balls flying towards the life petals. And if they strike them, they take one out. Um, of course, defenders are trying to avoid getting hit. And so they're moving, dodging, weaving. They might throw up a digital energy shield to absorb the attack. And games are super, really fast paced. Um, lots of action, very physical. And, um, it, you know, that, that's kind of the game in a nutshell. What the players see through their headsets is what also the fans get to see who are maybe there physically present. Um, if it's being streamed on a, on a monitor or a big screen, um, or if it's streamed virtually, they're seeing it, you know, on whatever uh, platform it, they're, they're watching it on. And they're seeing all the augmented elements as well. So they're seeing the players, they're seeing the space, but they're seeing the energy balls fly. They're seeing the the collision when you know they they hit life pedals, they're seeing score and health stats and you know all those cool things that you'd normally see in a, an esports game uh, if you're watching the play action. All right, let's show the video. Tenai, the Hado World Cup final is happening here in Tokyo. Every fan in the world is holding their breath.
right, Shane, tell us what we just saw. It, it actually kind of takes me to how I was first introduced to Hada. And I, and I have to clarify, that's a promo video. Um, so there's a, there's a few creative liberties that were taken uh, as, you know, as a promotion. And I think there's even a few laws of physics that are broken uh, in there. Um, but uh, probably about two and a half years ago, I saw that video along with another one um, on social media. I was just looking around and I'm all my other business. I'm always looking for that next cool game, toy, software, something that we use in, in an educational setting to inspire kids what, what's possible with technology. And so I came across that video and I thought, OK, if this is real, like if this really exists as a game, um, I've got to I've got to have this. I, I got to bring this to our community here in Florida. And at the same time, um, I actually was introduced to Gerald Solomon, who maybe your audience may, may be familiar with. Gerald uh, leads the NASAF, which is North American Scholastic Esports Federation. Our community brought him in to speak to the community about Scholastic Esports. And I was suddenly just stunned to hear the statistics. I felt like well, I've been asleep for uh, you know maybe a few years. I've been teaching kids how to create video games and, and, and play with them and so on, and didn't realize there's 16 year olds making seven figure incomes. I, the size of the gaming industry and the, and the size of esports within that is a niche. And, and then scholastic esports growth was, was astounding to me. So at that moment, I remembered this promo video I saw on social media. I put two and two together and, and started to connect the dots and thinking, what if we brought that, you know, Hado, this unique physical esport into the scholastic space? I think we could really inspire a lot of kids and do some really neat things. So I, I tried to find out, okay, who, who has this? Found out it was it came from Japan, uh, from a company called Mayleap Inc. And I uh, reached out to them and said, okay, where can I try this? I'd like to bring it to Florida. And they, they shared with me that uh, they didn't have a Florida distributor. They had a lot of traction already in Asia and, and it was starting to grow in Europe, but really didn't have growth yet in America. And so I quickly sort of shared what I thought would be an ideal strategy for them, which involves a scholastic form and collegiate form of, of the program, along with some, some more commercialized um, business activities. Uh, they liked what they heard. And so I was on my way to um, Tokyo to meet with them directly. And a week or two later, COVID hit. <laughs> um, oh. so, my, so we've all been there. We know what the pandemic did. And so that kind of slowed things down a, a little bit, to, to say the least. Um, but in between lockdowns, I did get to try out Hado, you know, to make sure this is real. It's not just the, you know, just the promo video. It's the real deal. And, and I did that in L.A. There was a temporary studio set up there. Tried it out. Loved it. You know, I realized it, it really does work. It, it's amazing experience. And I could really see how this would fit. And so throughout the COVID lockdown period, we negotiated with, with our Japanese uh, amazing partners. And uh, we now have the exclusive uh, rights partnership to develop Hado uh, here in, in the United States. So that's that's a little backstory to that video. It's that that video really kind of represents the competition side of, of Hado. And there's already uh, tournaments, there's international, national, and regional tournaments uh, in throughout Europe, throughout Asia. We have one penciled in already for America. We get we're gonna have a our first sort of official national tournament uh, in December. Uh, where and how and all that is still secret. Uh, we'll be announcing that soon, but we're pretty excited for that part of, of Hado. But uh, to, to get there, we actually have to um, educate the public. So I'm grateful for this opportunity uh, that you've given us because we've got to put Hado out there. We need to, it's a new sport. Japanese, uh, our partners call it a techno sport. And um, so working through the esports gaming community as well as the sports community and kind of bringing them together we're, we're kind of evangelizing, we're putting it out there, we're working with schools, colleges, the public, big, large, uh, even community-based events. We're bringing on uh, potential uh, licensed operators to get it across the country because it is location-based. And then from there, we'll, of course, we'll get into the, the adrenaline pumping, exciting competition experience and, you know, with, uh, on the hunt for uh, and, and on the path or journey to find Team USA and, of course, eventually bring that gold uh, back here. But we got some catch up to do. So I did have uh, Gerald Solomon from NASA on a previous show. And, uh, uh, you know, definitely he's a good person to, you know, sing its praises for sure. Um, now, is this the future of PE or physical education in school? 
that's actually a really um, observant um, because actually about 12 years ago, I was actually um, introduced to uh, call, something called exergaming where there was kind of an approach to teach future PE teachers how to harness gaming technology, everything from Wii you know, systems to pretty large sort of commercial level game systems that were kind of mechanized and gamified. And the idea was to create these super circuits uh, in, in PE classes um, to engage kids, sort of fight fire with fire, get them, you know, you're, we're not gonna take technology away from kids and, and you know, and, and there's, there's some legitimate criticism of, of some maybe not as such healthy behaviors when um, technology is misused, but they were, the idea is how do we use it in a way to you know, guide kids the right way? And so there was some really great research being done back then at um, University of South Florida. And I actually founded a charter school and we're getting, <laughs> I do other things, but, um, and put this extra gaming lab in there. And to your point, I mean, I've moved on since, but it, it really, that actually probably is what caught my attention with Hotto because I saw, wow, 12 years later, this is how this has evolved, you know, augmented reality, mixed reality. And one of our first pilot sites is at a, a middle school here in Florida. And the program is actually operated by a PE teacher and it's, it's rolled into his PE program. Um, we're also um, very close to, to setting up a pilot at, um, at USF in partnership We've, we've done some demos with their, um, uh, uh, the athletics health department, working with their, their teams um, and linking up with, with uh, maybe their recreation department. So um, there's just so many areas where this could apply and fit because I think it, it kind of straddles between sports and gaming and esports. Yeah, and you know, um, I think that there's another thing that it, it solves a problem, okay? And let me tell you why I think it solves the problem. I think it solves the problem of the Olympics having esports because, frankly, one of the downsides of having esports in the Olympics is it's not as physical as people want it to be. Okay. So, this is that physicality that the Olympics is famous for. So, I would think that along with Rocket League and the other games, that are being considered for future Olympics, that Hado would be it. Uh, absolutely, I, I would. I would love that. Um, and, I, and I think you're right. And, and you know, Hado happens to be kind of maybe first as this sort of formalized physical gaming sport. But I think I, I believe we're probably going to rapidly see lots of different games sort of get into that mixed reality, extended reality experience. And the more physical can, it can be, I think, uh, and not all of them can be, but, um, you know, I, I think that's going to make them more engaging. And, and to your point, uh, yeah, more, more welcomed into uh, something like the Olympics and, and traditional, um, you know, big, huge sports um, competition like that. So let's show the second video and get into how it works. How difficult is it to master um, Hado? Um, the, there's good news. It's it's very easy to take up and play immediately. Uh, within a, within a minute or so of instructions, when I went out to LA, I was playing Hado um, and surviving um, much longer than I survived when I the first time I tried Fortnite. Um, but um, so, so anybody can easily take up how to have fun and learn how to play at a recreational level or, or a discovery you know, center level of experience. And within a few matches, um, 
players are already hungry to figure out strategy and there's you know there's skill point levels that you can control um, between your team sort of devised to uh, go along with your preferred playing style or strategically to win in competition you can allocate between you know the players on the team um, the speed of the energy ball or how fast it will recharge or how large it will be or how many shields you get and strategically you decide who's going to be the defender who's going to be the attacker and, and so forth to, to you know to devise winning gameplay that being said uh, it, it may take, uh, you know, maybe this is exaggerating, but a lifetime to master. Certainly the, the competition matches that I've watched from Japan, the teams were playing for money and, and so on in informal competition, it's remarkable skill. Um, you know, they're not only the gameplay and the strategy, but also just the, just the physicality and, and the athleticism. I've seen some clips where there's, a, there's one of the players in particular, he reminds me of the movie, you know, in the Matrix. There's those kind of moves, you know, like, leaning back and just out, turning sideways and you know avoiding getting hit by an energy ball and i'm thinking these are really fast 80 second matches i barely know where i where i am um and they're giving instructions to each other and so on so just like a real sport or like i've seen esports players you know with the headsets on giving each other instructions for that strategic gameplay that that's also the case in hado as well sure and those ones that are mastering it would be the olympians for sure so um, how does um, an AR game like Hado differ from current VR game experience? I would probably, I mean, the, the simplest explanation that I use, and I, I just, for me, I got to put it for myself into real simple layman's terms, I think. Um, I describe, you know, VR takes you into, uh, takes you in the physical world into the digital world it's completely immersive typically experience where Hado and ar really brings elements of the digital world into the physical world so you're still here it's just we've got all these really cool elements and you know the phenomenon with pokemon go and so on which is a very simple form of, of augmented reality i think people can kind of understand that if, if they've been exposed to that um, and then there's, of course, mixed reality and extended reality, and you know, sort of these descriptive terms for all of this. And I think, um, you know, we're, we're just we're just at the tip of the iceberg of of what all that's going to look like. Certainly in gaming, far beyond my understanding, I I feel like I'm I'm grateful to even be kind of included or invited to the conversation in, in esports and, and learning an incredible amount and, and catching up. But um, it's pretty obvious, particularly I think with augmented reality, that it's going. The use of augmented reality is going to permeate every aspect of life in some way at some point in the future. Everything from education to business cases and uses, and, and you know, recreation and um, just for fun, and then of course with sports. So it's going to be interesting to see that play out. And, and I'm thankful that Pato is, you know, is has harnessed augmented reality. Um, one quick point, if I may, bring up what we found that kind of surprised me because I didn't, I wasn't fully aware of the difference. You know, I explored the space station in a VR gear, so I get that. Um, I felt like I was there. With Hado, um, some of the good feedback that we've gotten is people that have not been able to enjoy a VR experience because they might suffer some disorientation or motion sickness, or they, they just didn't respond very well. And there's, there's a certain segment of, of the population, I'm one that, you know, has vertigo and some of those things, um, don't enjoy it. And um, we've got much less, if any, complaints with Hado, and I'm not sure if it's completely because of the augmented nature of it, um, because you still see the space, you're staring at the screen in front of your gear, but you're still um, seeing the real space. And so you don't have that same disorientation or have to come back to reality. You've been seeing it the whole time. The other thing is if you can look in the gear, it's a simple headset, it's clear. You can, you can see right through the sides, you have full peripheral vision. And oh, so- okay. Even from a sense of feeling safe or secure, we found comments from folks that were maybe afraid of VR because they don't want to bump into something or somebody would touch them or they wouldn't quite feel safe. Um, they have no problem doing this because it just, it just felt a little bit more comfortable to try it. Um, and then the matches are short. They're quick and you're in and out of matches. So I think you're not having those long uh, you know, exposure periods to, to VR. Sure, okay. And then uh, speaking of that, um... Do you see a place for Hado in Web3, the metaverse, and token economy? I think so. I mean, I don't have any secret information to our developers in, in Japan, so I, don't, I can't 
I, you know, and if I did, I won't be able to share whatever they're, you know, they're cooking up. But um, there's certainly a lot of development going on there. And, and I know that our team is as well. There's an interesting, two interesting experiments, and I, hopefully we'll have time that I can quickly share them. One that's captured my interest was actually through uh, my counterpart in the UK, Jim Sefton and his team at Hado UK. And they, um, they partnered with a number of groups, including uh, an accelerator, uh, like an like a education accelerator. Also, I think it was Vodafone look, looking at 5G technologies, edge computing, and another group, I think it was Noidum, um, involved in uh, motion capture tech. And what they did was they actually had um, one Hado team in one physical location and the other Hado team in a complete, I think it was a completely different city and using all that technology. And one of the teams had mocap gear, they're all geared up, they played. And because the, camp, the way Hado works, you, you wouldn't normally have been able to see the other team in front of you if only half was there, but the team in mocap gear was represented through these avatars and so on. So obviously that's a, just a one quick step from having gameplay occurring in the physical world, but then represented in the metaverse, you know, and using Web3 technologies and so on. And whether it's, whether it's just a streaming experience for the, the spectators or spectators as well as players represented as avatars, that seems to me to be an interesting next step. Um, and, and some of that technology, the physical technology of 5G is, is going to help make that happen. The other really interesting, and this is no longer an experiment, it's actually a functional business pilot in Japan. The flagship studio where the Hado uh, courts are, they actually have one that um, is a studio for um, entertainment. And so it's a streaming studio, full production. It's got a place for about 200, 220 um, spectators, fans. And they've got J-pop idol groups coming in and, and um, actors and so on. And they're playing against each other in scheduled matches that catch attention. And so they have a, an additional separate app where the fans download the app. It's, it's, um, it's a, basically a tipping app. So while they're watching either live or the stream gameplay, they're tipping their favorite player. This is familiar to esports um, in Caspers and so on. They're tipping their players. And that immediately, um, if they get enough tips, the team that in the next match gets an extra skill point. So they're actually affecting gameplay. And it's proven to be incredibly successful and, and really popular. And so they've actually, I mean, it's standing room only. There, a lot of the, the viewers are, are doing this now online because the space isn't big enough to hold it. So I think that whole, the token, that, that's so close to the tokenomics that, that we think, you know, watch to earn, a play to earn kind of model. Um, I, I can see that happening. Um, I'm going to Japan in a few weeks to study that particular location closely to see how could that be adapted to our environment in our business community here. So um, I'm sure that people watching will want to know, how can they play this at home? I wish I, they could. Right now it is location-based. So we're looking for operators, licensed operators and locations, and that's part of our business strategy. I don't think there's ever going to be, um, at this point, a strategy to put Hado as a consumer product to just do by yourself, like a home system. Oh. Um, the whole vision is to bring people together. And I think that's actually been really welcomed after the pandemic. We've, we've, we've just got so many invitations to come out and, and bring Hado. Um, that being said, though, I think there will be a point when players at home uh, or, or one group will be able to play another group that maybe is not located in the same place, almost like a pickup game of soccer for practice or, or any other kind of sport or, or a, a small group coming together to, to have an eSport you know, game together. Um, that's possible. You know, I also see it as a special occasion type of activity where you have a birthday party and you're trying to figure out something to do. And, you know, people go to escape rooms or they do certain things, but this would be a really unique thing that would be, you know, um, special. Exactly. And, and even we're getting invites to big corporate events. Um, to just it's more fun for networking. Gen Z likes this kind of stuff. They look at me handing out a business card and they say, oh, you still have cards, Boomer? Like, um, you know, they, they, they like something that's, that's fun and engaging and kind of speaks their language. And a, a surreal moment for me was we were at a big um, investor event and Hada was, it was that the Amelie Arena, which is in Tampa, where the, the Tampa Bay Lightning play their home, their home arena. And we had gameplay happening under center ice and it was streamed live on the 50 foot jumbotron. For a hockey fan growing up like me, that was surreal. Like I had goosebumps, but 
And that was a corporate event. So I think there's lots of application for this. Sure. And let's show the calisthenics photo. So, I so tell us about this. I mean, people are actually having to like warm up. It, exactly. Um, for, truly for, for competition and also where we see it in the scholastic uh, space, your question about PE class, this is physical. And so we've got a lot of opportunity to not only prepare to do it safely and do it right and, and to be competitive, but also to, to maybe make some of those things more fun and more engaging to that, that will be helpful to teachers. Uh, but of course, when, I, when I've seen the, the competitive players, you have to do that. Um, I tried to do some of that at a couple of matches when I got carried away, just, you know, in the moment. And I hurt for about three or four days. So, uh, you know, <laughs> um, the, the calisthenics is important. All right. So that leads to that the value of this because it's unique and, and um, it does appeal to Gen Z. And it, I think it would appeal to anyone who likes to play dodgeball and would like to step up their their um, augmented reality game. Um, so I'll give you the last word, Shane. Can you tell us how people can find you? Absolutely. Um, please visit us at um, hado-usa.com. Um, you can see some of the same videos that Catherine just shared, maybe a, a few more. And uh, it, it explains gameplay a little bit more. And there's uh, a great, uh, I think a simple form. We're not gonna bother you or, or bombard you with information, but if you wanna get in the game, cause you can literally get in the game with Otto, um, you know, reach out and we'll let you know where, where our first operations and pilots are running. And if somebody wants to bring it to the area, we need Hado Hawaii, I know that. So, um, you know, reach out and uh, we're ready to go as soon as we've got the partners to do it. All right, we definitely need Hado Hawaii. Well, uh, thank you so much, Shane, and I really appreciate you being here to tell us all about it. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate the opportunity, Catherine. And um, yeah, I'd like everybody to get in the game. So thank you. All right. So thank you to our viewers for joining us today. In two weeks, my guest will be Reginald Nisoa joining us from Ghana to talk about esports in Africa. See you then. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.